Constructing Digital Research Collections, Remarks by Chuck Henry, Ed Van Gammert, and Brewster Kale at the 159th ARL Membership Meeting, convened by Deanna Markham. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deanna Markham. I'm uh, beyond established. I'm now fading, I think. <laughs> so we, we all have our little order, I guess. Um, delighted to have you here for this session um, entitled Constructing Digital Research Collections. Uh, a few of us in this room have been working on the notion of a digital library for longer than we care to <clears throat> think about. And we've seen many manifestations of uh, digital collections uh, trying to become digital libraries. A decade ago, many of our libraries were working on uh, digitizing special collections, the beautiful, the rare, and they were almost like publications for the website. And we've seen a real transition to uh, collaborative work that will that will result in an honest to goodness digital library. So we have three speakers today to talk about some of the initiatives that are underway that involve collaboration and rethinking what we are doing. Um, we are running a little behind time, so I'm, I'm just going to introduce the speakers by name. In the program, there's very nice biographical statement for each of them. But I think uh, we'd rather hear about your future thoughts than your past, if that's OK. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, our three speakers, uh, Chuck Henry, Charles Henry, uh, the president of the Council on Library and Information Resources, uh, formerly um, at Rice University and Columbia before that. Um, Ed Van Gemmert is the deputy director and the Associate Director for Public Services at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Brewster Kale is a um, digital librarian and founder of the Internet Archive. And what I've asked these um, speakers to talk about is uh, each of them will talk about one of the initiatives that's now underway. Um, I'm asking them to describe what is it? What's it all about? Who's involved? Um, how does it affect or can affect uh, ARL libraries? And um, do you see these as important initiatives for uh, true collaboration that leads to the kinds of results we're all looking for? Or do you have something else in mind that you think would work better? So with that, um, I'm going to ask them to speak. Um, we will go in the order that you see them at the table, beginning with Chuck Henry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Deanna. It's a great pleasure to be here, as always. Um, I get to uh, talk about the Digital Public Library of America. And as Deanna said, that large-scale digital libraries have been under discussion for decades. Uh, this one is probably the most recent. Um, it's been around for about a year, uh, and it has garnered a great deal of attention. Um, and, uh, and interest um, for uh, something that's been relatively short-lived. Um, the as those of you who have some familiarity with this project uh, know that it is susceptible to many interpretations, and I, I will just give you my take on it this afternoon, um, and then we can talk more. We can triangulate with some of the other steering committee members to see where this uh, where this may go. Um, every term. Almost every term in the title, Digital Public Library of America, has been contested. Um, and uh, it goes on and on. Or maybe of. We haven't seen much email on of yet, but there's time. Um, and to give you an example, I, I think that the interest um, and the concern and the potential threat of this is this legitimate. Um, and something to keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, the term public has probably received more 
um, email exchange and more consternation than, than the other, other words here. Um, many, if not all, the state public libraries and many, many um, city and town public libraries uh, were very concerned from the beginning of the use of the term public. And their concern focused mostly on um, the possibility of if this took off, if this really was built, if we did build this very large, you know, millions and millions of digital objects library and called it public, that funding for their libraries would decrease, that the funding would go towards this and not to them. And I, you know, I raise that because that may be, there may be some truth in this. And always when a project gets going uh, with this amount of funding at this scale uh, and involves so many different constituencies, I think these issues uh, are going to be raised. They're healthy to raise them. And again, something to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to be fairly brief and just give you a kind of chronological um, story, uh, I guess narrative, of the Digital Public Library with a few editorial comments as we go along. They are mine. They don't represent necessarily the steering committee or the project. Um, the Digital Public Library of America got started a little over a year ago, uh, and it was largely the initiative of Robert Darton, who was a uh, Harvard librarian, librarian in college at the time. I think many of you know Bob, and know his work. He's a quite distinguished um, 18th century French historian. Um, and he uh, was um, concerned, and here comes the editorial part. I think Bob and some others were concerned at Google and Google Books, and their concerns had to do with a, um, an industry, a corporation that was uh, digitizing um, vociferously our cultural heritage. And at the same time, there was a lot of uncertainty about the access of this cultural heritage. There was uncertainty about what this might cost, how we were going to uh, use this, were we going to be charged per page. There was also concern, I think, about the quality of the scans and, and the difficulty often in trying to determine the provenance of some of these objects. Um, so Bob and others got together and felt that perhaps if we banded together, we being the libraries, archives, museums, academic institutions, and scholars, um, could we, in fact, put together what might be called or seen as something counter to Google, um, that we could build a digital public library that was more encompassing, that was open, open to the public, that was a true national good, uh, and that would be a kind of aggregation of our, our cultural heritage in all the different kinds of media, text and images, moving images and such. So the concept, I think, was, was interesting. Um, there was a meeting in Cambridge, um, and the project was uh, began. The management of this project was turned over uh, to the Berkman Center for Society and, and uh, Internet and Society, and Berkman still manages this. Um, the Sloan Foundation put up money, uh, considerable money, uh, millions of dollars in this case, uh, for this project, basically for fraud project planning. Um, so it has a healthy chest, it has a healthy uh, uh, revenue base or, or a reserve at this point to, to move forward. Sloan funded this for 18 months. So we're about a year into the game and I imagine it's going to take another year or possibly more uh, in the planning process. So the funding was there. The statement that came out of the meeting in Cambridge uh, a year ago almost to the day was that the Digital Public Library of America, or whatever it eventually is going to be called, uh, would be an open distributed network of comprehensive online resources drawn from the nation's cultural heritage. And its main intent would be to educate, inform, and empower current and future generations. And I think that's a very lofty goal, and I think it still holds true. I think that rhetoric is still very much alive um, in the DPLA. After the meeting in October, um, the, a steering committee was formed. Deanna is on it. Brewster and I are on it. A number of ARL directors are also involved, other ARL directors. And uh, starting around last December, seven, seven or eight working groups, call, they call them work streams, uh, were put together. And I'll mention them briefly. Uh, a lot of this information, if you really want to dig down into the DPLA, it has a really good website. Uh, more information than you probably care to, to delve into, but it's there. Uh, and it's actually quite, uh, some of it's quite interesting. Some of these work streams are as follows, audience and participation. And now the work streams are made up of anywhere from probably about 10 to 15 people drawn from libraries, drawn from archives, scholars are involved. 
uh, and museum people, um, some funding agencies participate. Um, so it's a very interesting mix. Uh, from our various communities and constituencies. So audience and participation, that work stream, um, they're asking questions as the Digital Public Library of America begins to take shape. Who is being served? What's the audience? Um, and the, you know, the thinking right now is that it has to be as broadly conceived as possible. It has to have multiple constituencies. Well, okay, who are they? Uh, and what benefits accrue to these con communities? Uh, this work stream will also look at uh, how success will be measured. You know, if the DPLA is serving its mission, how do you measure that? How do you, how do you assess its efficacy? Uh, what are the methods of outreach? How do we reach out to more communities? How do we reach out to our own community to talk about this? So that group is focusing on these questions. Again, these groups are dealing with questions that are logical and like they're pertinent to everything that, that we do um, here in this room. Um, on, on a national scale. Another work stream is content and scope. Um, this is basically formulating a collection development policy for the DPLA. Uh, it's also looking at metadata issues, interoperability, um, and looks and is questioning the term, what is critical mass? If this is going to work. How big does it have to be to work? Um, and again, good questions. Uh, financial and business model, more extreme, self-explanatory, looking at sustainable business plans for this venture. Governance, another timely, thorny issue. Uh, how will the DPLA be managed? Uh, what will be the rules, the policies of its governance? Will there be a system of self-monitoring? Will there be the ability to modify the rules? And who will be represented on the governance? through the governance. Um, legal issues, uh, Pam Samuelson is leading this up. Um, this is, again, obviously how to best approach and influence legal and copyright environment in which we are currently mired, I suppose, and muddled. Um, and Sloan, the Sloan Foundation, has put up a, a special fund for this. So there's a large, a good, good amount of money that's going into this, uh, to the study of the legal issues involved. Technical aspects, again, um, looking at uh, how, what kind of digital architecture would be most appropriate that would conform and advance the mission of the DPLA. So um, these groups were put together, and there's a few more. Um, and there was another meeting uh, in Cambridge in February um, with the steering committee and, and other many others attended. And that meeting, we discussed again some issues. All these issues had come up. The work streams were discussed. The, the mission statement was dis discussed. The name of the project was discussed. And I think, to be fair, and, uh, but again, this is my take, at the end of that meeting, uh, a group of us got together and felt that another year um, or more of discussion and planning um, was perhaps a bit too vague um, and too long. And out of that, um, we felt it was important to, to begin to build this, um, or at least begin to build aspects, or begin to test some of the assumptions through building components of it. In other words, keep talking, but get off the dime and start putting something up. And I think this, this um, uh, acknowledgement, uh, and I would say this a little bit of frustration, was elegantly um, uh, conveyed into what was called the beta sprint, and some of you may have heard that about that. This is essentially, an, oh, it's not a contest so much, it's just sort of an open call for innovative proposals uh, that could help build and build more rapidly the digital library, the Digital Public Library of America. And these proposals, uh, it was when the uh, prospectus was put out. They could be ideas, they could be models, they could be prototypes, technical tools, interfaces, all the kinds of aspects of building a, a very large scale digital library. And to t more or less sort of deconstruct it, look at its components and throw some proposals out uh, that might help all of us think about the complexity of this and also models that might be used in, in, in building it. Uh, about 45 proposals were received. Um, a very distinguished panel reviewed them um, in September, and nine of these proposals uh, will be presented next week. Uh, the national rollout of the Digital Public Library is in Washington next Friday. It's all-day event. It's being sponsored by um, 
the National Archives. Uh, there will be a series of speakers, and uh, I think the idea of this, the concept of it, will be, I hope, much more sharply clarified through this national meeting. Um, and the projects that will be presented will also give you a much better idea of where people are, are coming at this. Um, briefly, I'll talk about these projects and then conclude. Um, some of the projects, there is the, uh, the coordination of the American National, what is called the American National Digital Collections, and that's a proposal that's from the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and the Smithsonian. And then we'll talk about how how their digital collections can be better made coherent, correlate, and, and more easily uh, accessed and queried. Um, there's also um, a, a proposal looking at uh, metadata, interoperable metadata uh, for, for the DPLA. Um, there's a sh uh, proposal called Shelf Life and Library Cloud that's looking at combined content exploration with a social component looking at content and also then connecting with other people who are looking at similar content, sort of building communities, virtual communities around this. Um, my organization is making a presentation as well, CLEAR through the Digital Library Federation. As you all know now, it's back into CLEAR. Um, and we're, we, we have built a prototype that's based on an IMLS-funded uh, project of um, the Digital Collections and Content Registry, also called Opening History. And that's several million digital objects, and what the team has done is to um, bring them together. Uh, these are multimedia objects as well. They're text and images and moving images, and they sort of cut across uh, American cultural heritage. And uh, the team's been working on how to make this more coherent and usable uh, as a possible prototype. Um, this project is uh, based on the Europeana, which many of you are probably familiar with. And um, I raise that because, uh, again, a bit of editorial comment here. I think the inclination of this project is to look at models like Europeana um, uh, as an example. And that model would be that the DPLA, again, this could change in a week, but I don't think so. Uh, the DPLA would be much more of a federation of existing and future digital objects. It wouldn't own anything. Uh, the institutions that currently have large digital libraries and institutions that can contribute uh, over time will do so. Um, the job, the uh, contribution of the DPLA would be to build, um, to set standards, metadata standards, interoperability standards to uh, help aggregate and federate these millions upon millions of digital objects, as well as to create APIs uh, to use this material more efficiently and effectively. Um, and that's the model that, that it seems to me makes the most sense, but again, we can, we can certainly discuss that. Um, so that's what's going on, and that's the way this project has been attacked um, and managed, and I think it's been actually managed very well. Um, some, just some concluding remarks to speak to some of Deanna's questions. Um, this is not um, a library per se. I mean, and, and you know, his, the term library is somewhat misleading here. Um, I don't think this project is out to build a new library. It's out to make visible and reveal this incredible array of assets that we have already that are very difficult to, to, to access because of the siloed nature of, of our world. Um, and also, I think, to look forward to set up those, to develop the platform, the architecture, and the standards in order for people to contribute to this over time. In that sense, if it's done well, it's not going to compete. It's not a competition, um, but it is a service. To, to all of us, or should be. Um, I honestly think that it is a national good, or could be, uh, and a very exciting one. Uh, it's already attracted, and this, uh, this alone, it seems to me, is worth our attention. It's attracted a really strong pool of talent to this. Those proposals are quite good, um, and a lot of the top people are involved with this now. And I think that, that, that in itself is, is, is uh, noteworthy. Uh, it also has uh, clearly the interest of, of significant funding uh, and funding agencies. So there is, uh, there's a will here, and there may be a way um, to build this, at least financially, uh, over time. Um, I, I think in closing, 
Uh, this project, it's nascent, obviously. You know, it's contested at every turn. Uh, it's it's uh, sort of building, uh, actually building quickly, but a bit, you know, intermittently and somewhat ad hocly. That's okay. But I think it's an, Im I, I really do think that this is a project to watch. Uh, and I think that's a, a particularly for ARL, uh, it has on, I think, in, enormous significance over time. Um, if my sense of this, again, and concluding here, is that that the, there's a lot of constituencies that could be represented here and many, many constitu constituencies who contribute uh, small amounts of, of digital library material or, or vast amounts of digital library material. If this is going to be done well, uh, it has to be a project and a program that can respond to the most disparate and varied kinds of questions. And it's the user that has to drive this. And my sense is that if we do this well, um, that we would have hundreds of millions of objects um, that could be efficiently searched, that could allow for new questions to be asked, that could allow new methodologies to, to come into existence, that could create new kinds of scholarly models of communication, uh, and a project that could be as of fundamental importance you know, to our senior scholars as well as to a curious 10-year-old who's interested in the Middle Ages. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I should probably also just disclose, too, that in addition to my work at Wisconsin, I'm also the uh, chair of the Strategic Advisory Board for the Hathi Trust and uh, sit on the, um, I'm ex officio on the, on the executive committee as well, just so you're aware of that. Um, I'm really pleased to be uh, speaking with, uh, with Chuck and Brewster, um, and I, <clears throat> I do want to echo a couple of things that Chuck said, too, about this not being a competition, in a sense. When friends of mine asked, uh, how on earth are you going to create space up here with, uh, with, with Chuck and Brewster for, for Hathi Trust, um, you know, that, that, that was my pretty quick conclusion, that, that there's, although there are limited resources today, there's a lot of work here in this space. And I think that the, the, one of the main issues is how we think clearly and coordinate our efforts, regardless of what's gone on in the past. So I've got a couple of slides here um, in an attempt to keep me on track in terms of trying to um, address some of Deanna's questions that she posed to us. Um, uh, given that I am fully aware, <clears throat> so I've been here since last Friday, I'm beginning to feel like an honorary Washingtonian, but um, I know that a number of you, about 60 in fact, were at the Constitutional Convention for the Hathi Trust earlier in the week. So I'm going to try my best not to uh, bore the heck out of you with, uh, with repeating a lot of that information, but I'm also aware too that a number of you uh, weren't at that, uh, that convention and, and there might be questions or information you'd like to know about Hathi Trust. So I'm going to go over some of it at a fairly high level and um, my remarks are intended to try to generate some discussion about about larger, broader issues of collaboration that we could try to address across organizations. Hathi Trust is three years old and it is, was, and is all about preservation of digital content. What to do with all this Google stuff was initially on our minds. But it has become since then also an avenue for access and an avenue for us to be thinking about our print collections as well as, as other collective decisions that we're able to be thinking about for planning our libraries. It is becoming a comprehensive collection. And maybe most important in terms of a value or a principle is the notion of moving ahead with a shared vision. Whether it be particularly, um, as, as one example, uh, the, the whole area of rights clearance is becoming of more interest to the membership. Not only with university presses, for example, but with our own scholarly authors on campus and elsewhere.
Also, the trademark, I think, of openness and transparency is one that um, Hathi Trust governance and members try to achieve. For example, we're talking now about the possibility of using um, uh, Creative Commons licenses for the development of the various programming that we're working on. Certainly one of the accomplishments is the membership, I think, over the course of three years. We're now at 60 plus. Um, pretty remarkable when you stop to think about it, I think. Um, I love this slide. It's not mine. I stole it from John Wilkin. And basically it, it, it shows a direction in terms of Hathi Trust thinking. So at the beginning, <clears throat> we were all about how much is this going to cost by the drink for us to pay for storage and preservation of our digital content. We're one of those institutions at Wisconsin where when we costed out how much it would cost locally in Madison to store the material, it turned out to be three times more expensive for, for me to store it locally than it did through the Hathi Trust. And um, so the so the, Moving from that sort of a notion of paying by the drink to a broader concept, uh, uh, thinking more as a shared digital repository, thinking about how we can apply the digital content more, um, more broadly to how we plan our libraries, uh, and moving a cost model toward that rather than just paying for our own preservation of material. So on average, basically what this is saying, for example, for Wisconsin, a little bit under 40% of our holdings, things that we at Wisconsin held or uh, hold, are represented in uh, the digital repository, the Hathi Trust digital repository. P pretty remarkable. The growth is somewhat astounding. Uh, just a little bit under 10 million. Uh, last night it was at 9.7 when I updated this slide. If you look today, it would be something more than that. Um, the, the public domain material at a, a little bit under 2.7 million has been predictably and reliably around 27% for, uh, for quite a while. Interestingly for me is that um, over the course of time, <clears throat> there have been fewer than 20 requests for takedown by rights holders over a digital repository of, of 10 million books, whereas um, conversely, more than 5,000 uh, requests have been made to open up material by rights holders. We all know that libraries exist in a changing landscape in our universities. We're, we're in many cases, a microcosm of what's happening in, in our universities. And um, we're seeing at every level more and more collective decisions being made. When at Wisconsin, when we talk about, about digital preservation, when we talk about programming, when we talk about um, technology today, we always bring Hathi Trust into the conversation. To put it simply, we simply can't afford uh, to do our work separately that could be done collaboratively. So um, I've already mentioned a little bit about the sharing the cost, but I'd like to say just a few words about the governance of Hathi Trust, which is interesting, to say the least. Um, it has an executive committee, and the executive committee was initially appointed from the uh, CSC and the University of California, uh, and also from the University of Michigan and Indiana University, the two founding members. and. Um, has um, just concluded with our constitutional convention where we're moving into uh, what we think of as phase two in terms of leadership and governance for Hathi Trust. In my estimation, one of the major challenges will be to maintain a very high level of, of leadership for, for the organization, a very high level of agility, and, uh, the, abil and the ability to focus, which I'll sometimes are always not in the same sentence. So, um, you know, pay, um, partners uh, want that balance between those that contribute a lot of resources and dollars to be able to have more of a say in the direction of the organization and sustaining members who join um, to use public domain content to because they believe in the operation also want a say in uh, the uh, direction of the organization as well. 
I won't go through each and every one of these, what I call practical rollouts, but I think they give you a sense as to some of the, the values and some of the efforts and the principles that we've been focused on. Um, in March of 2011, CRL certified uh, Hathi Trust as one of only two uh, digital repositories. And, um, and, and secondly, um, uh, something I think is occurring that is of importance, there's, there's a lot of discussion about the, the quality of, of digital files, regardless of the repository. And um, coincidentally, Paul Conway at, at Michigan is using Hathi Trust as a basis for his IMLS study of quality in digital files. This is, this is important because it will establish a benchmark. It begins to measure the, the quality of digital files. So what's the scope of the problem? Is it a problem? And, and so if, for example, there's a small percentage of items in the repository that uh, are, are not of high quality, what would it take, what would it cost to, be, to fix those, and, 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 and how could we go about doing that? So it'll be, it'll be good to have that measurement. And I mentioned a little bit about permissions before. Um, the whole area of access to um, in and out of copyright material for for uh, patrons with um, with print disabilities is is an issue that we've been working on for some time and are ready to roll out. Michigan already has it in play, um, and and you know probably maybe the most controversial piece that we're working on certainly is, and I've, I've bolded lawful uses because I believe that we only have lawful uses of in-copyright material, but Section 108 um, uses with uh, replacement uh, copies and, and also access to orphan works that we believe strongly in and intend to continue to move forward on. Um, so one of the things that emerged from the Constitutional Convention was this notion that we may not all have to move forward exactly in step. That it's certainly possible that what's emerging, uh, for example, in working with university presses, that there may be two or three institutions who might want to take the lead in that area and, and work with presses to open up their material in, in the repository or some of these other areas, and that that work might influence the organization as a whole and others may join in. Some of the other moving forward issues that I hope represent a little bit broader collaboration possibilities would be the desire to want to increase the size of the repository. Even though it's at a little bit under 10 million, we think that with some effort we could get to 15 with um, the inclusion of some of the North American collections that are, still remain out there. And also keep in mind we've got a number of Canadian uh, participating libraries as well. Um, the whole issue of international membership for the Hathi Trust is, is important, but it's probably more complicated than introducing North American libraries into the into the organization. There are lots of other copyright issues. There are lots of and there are lots of other repositories too, of course, around the world too. So, um, I think that the international membership for Hathi Trust is going to have to take a separate focus and uh, uh, a more strategic focus. I was talking to the chair of our um, our classics department on campus a couple of weeks ago. And keep in mind, this is Middle Earth for the humanities. Um, and I, I was telling her that we would no longer, the library would no longer be able to re maintain a uh, locked and keyed Greek and Latin reading room. And that, and that um, we would, in addition to that, we, uh, the, the materials, the volumes in the current Greek and Latin reading room, <coughs> excuse me, are um, likely candidates for storage. And I was expecting all hell to break loose. And she looked at me and said, Ed, you know, it's no problem. It's not, and I almost fell over dead. And, and she said, you know, um, most of the core material in classics 
from the late 19th and early 20th centuries available to me, us, in, in, in the Hathi Trust and through Google Books. And so we can take this dis decision in stride. And I thought, it's going to be a good week. Um, and so, but one of the areas that that, that we really need to focus on more generally is, um, is, is, is the whole educational piece because I think um, she might be an exception in terms of our faculty understanding of and about the value of Hathi Trust. I think that uh, my observation is that many of our selectors and bibliographers probably do the best job in terms of outreach to our faculty and scholars as to, as to why they uh, would want to be using the collections and, and how to use the collections. A third area is, of course, um, what are we doing about non-book material? And uh, what are we doing about special collections material? That's the, the stuff that Google didn't digitize. Um, you know, I think, I don't know the exact number, but Google digitized about 20 million volumes, um, which is an astounding accomplishment. But, you know, that was pretty much kind of the easy stuff, if I could say that. I mean, a huge, huge contribution. And, and we, we, we wouldn't be talking about the Hathi Trust and other organizations like it without, without Google work. But um, image collections, sound, video, um, uh, it, it, it really it takes a different level of focus and a lot more resources to be able to be thinking about those. Newspapers would be uh, a perfect example on our campuses. So we like to say that the Hathi Trust, that we're developing an organization that's a part of us rather than apart from us. And it is not perfect by any stretch. I mentioned a little bit about the leadership um, watching the Constitutional Convention um, roll out last week was, was really an interesting process to be, to be a part of. It really was like a convention, if you will, or a Constitutional Convention, that is. Um, and I, I, I mentioned before about the key for leadership moving forward. But, you know, we, we, can, we can think of organizations that we belong to that um, have become distant from us, that they're apart from us, and, and the costs get away from us. And, and Hathi Trust is, uh, is really entirely about the membership. And really, I think a case study for unfolding large-scale collaboration, um, being able to accomplish initiatives at a pipe dream level that we would never be able to accomplish on our own. The trick is, however, to be able to balance the, the values and the costs and the risks and to stay open-minded about moving forward. So um, I think I'll conclude at that point then. I'm Brewster Kale, um, Internet Archive, and I wrote desperately to Diana, please don't leave us, on my little slip of paper, and I slid it over to her, and uh, she wrote back, never. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm heartened. Um, so, Diana, I'm going to keep this. Uh, <laughs> um, this is, it's an honor to be here. I've only been to one other ARL meeting. I remember asking Dwayne uh, when he was president of ARL, or head of ARL, and, you know, should the Internet Archive join? Um, and he looked a little ashen um, at the time and, and, and said, uh, oh, don't do that to me. Um, um, but I, I think the Internet Archive has, has, has matured along, and, and um, so I thought I'd, I'd catch up a little bit um, uh, on, on sort of where we've uh, gotten to and, and how we've gotten there, but really hit this particular question, because um, I think we are at a crossroads, uh, and a very important one. And we will decide which way we go based on how you do your budgets. And if you continue doing the budgets the way you're doing them now, the course is clear. So I'm going to um, try to open a question here that I hope that you take seriously. Um, and it's buy or rent. And really, uh, it comes down to how different 
our books and e-books going forward. Because things have changed. We're not in a mainframe era anymore. We're in an era of the internet, and we're in the era where there's a great deal of storage and capacity of our computers in a distributed environment um, that really wasn't with us 10, 15 years ago when kind of we got our chops. Um, so there's, I think, some differences. But OK, who am I? Where are we now? Um, the Internet Archive, um, it's a 501c3 nonprofit library, uh, independent of government and universities. It's one of the top 250 websites on the Internet. We get about 2 million users a day. About 10 million books get downloaded a month. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a place on the Internet that is, is fairly, quite heavily frequented and we're a registered library. Uh, in California, we've um, been building collections of different sorts. Our newest collection is physical books. Um, so we've been, um, we've worked to try to figure out how to store physical books effectively. And we do things in the same way. We try to basically use ourselves as a guinea pig, but then offer our experiences. We try to knock a zero off of the cost of storing books. We want to make it so that if you don't want a deaccession, you don't have to for cost reasons. So either, if you are going to deaccession, we'll show up with a happy bunch of people and we'll, we'll pay for the shipping and, and take them away and credit you or not credit you um, if, if, if you're interested. Um, and we will try to keep one copy of every book that we collect uh, alive forever. But really what we would like is to offer you technologies so that you can go and store even more densely, less accessible, but at least they're not pulped, um, uh, to go and store away millions of books. So this is a, a modified shipping containers that are plumbed for temperature and humidity control. They've got individual environments so that if one has problems, doesn't spread out. You can store movies in one and books in another and records in another and, and other types of, of anyway. So, um, so the offer is open. We would like your books if you're going to throw them away. What really what we'd like you to do is consider not throwing out your books. Um, and it is very inexpensive to store millions of books. We have now 350,000 that are cataloged, and we've got another couple hundred thousand uh, to catalog, and we're starting to get good at this. So we think we're beyond the prototype stage. Um, moving images, we've got about 500,000 moving images. We've now gotten quite good at, at moving them forward into different formats and trying to get them distributed, dealing with the rights issues, which are thorny, but doable. Um, and these are a lot of them are user contributed, but also digitized um, moving images and lectures and the, and the like. We have about one million audio recordings. Um, these are very popular out there on the net, anything from news and public affairs types things uh, to lectures to uh, uh, recorded music. Um, again, all these are these are the publicly accessible ones, and we keep the ones that are commercially available uh, off offline um, uh, for all the normal rights issues. We've been collecting a lot of television. Where we recommend it. Um, it's an important cultural aspect that's underappreciated in our libraries. We now have over two about two million hours of television. We've been collecting television for uh, 10 years, 10 cha 20 channels, 24 hours a day. Iraqi television, um, Chinese, Russian, Japanese, uh, BBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, all, uh, basically a, a good swath. And we've now really turned up the uh, collecting into Africa and uh, trying to make sure that we've got key, key channels in every country. Um, that, that brings it beyond the uh, original 20. But again, even a small organization like ours can take on something of that scale. Uh, we have now, uh, about two weeks ago, we hit three million of electronic texts that are publicly accessible. About probably two, min two million of them is what you'd call books, um, but there's lots of other uh, types, of t uh, types of materials. Um, the, these mostly came from libraries like yours. Um, they were um, and the cost of our building this, the money that went through us, mostly for the digitization, was about $50 million over the, the last eight years. And I thank you very much. That it's basically those uh, libraries that are signing up to have no restrictions on the public domain. Those that basically want to make sure that anybody can have access to these. So these are the three million that are uh, publicly accessible. And then I'll, I'll go on about in copyright and some of the things that we're doing there. Um, the idea is to not show how great we are 
gosh, we think we are pretty darn terrific. Um, but it's uh, trying to show technologies and techniques that you can do these as well. I think one of the big things that have changed is the storage technology is quite a bit easier. So I remember visiting um, back in, I, oh gosh, it was forever ago, OCLC and asked us, how big was the database? Um, and if I remember it correctly, it came down to, and he calculated out, about 17 gigabytes. <laughs> and, you know, that sort of sounds like a thumb drive to you now, right? And, um, and it is. Um, so in this, uh, this is a, one of these new four terabyte hard drives. And um, if I'd finished loading it up with books, it would have 150,000 scanned books, searchable downloadable, browsable books. You probably get pushed, put it into a Macintosh, and it takes a little while, but then you have full text indexing on your desktop. So the idea of 150,000 books being like this, I'm not trying to make it look cheap. I'm just trying to make it look approachable. That the change has happened from the era of mainframes and requiring that to having it so that you can actually think about having something that kind of looks like a book. And if you had six of these, you'd have a million books. If you had 60 of these, you'd have 10 million books, which is kind of the number of a big library. So that's sort of a Yale or a Princeton or a Boston public library. So we use 10 million as the number that we're shooting for. And we have lots and lots and lots of web pages. Um, so, uh, so we got our start on, on collecting the web, and we have a lot of it, and we're trying to keep up with it. But the real point of this is to separate buy and rent and to try to give an idea of how we might be able uh, to proceed. Uh, yeah. Okay, and I'll, 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 I don't mean to be placating here, just let, but let me hit a couple of points because I think they're important. You buy, an, uh, you buy it once and then you own it. You can reformat it for new uses. So we're digitizing our collections and reusing them in digital form. In the movies collections, we've reformatted them six times. So going and reformatting is important to be able to do. And you can if you own it. You can organize and present it ourselves, and we can do distributed preservation. Frankly, this is the library system that I thought I was joining into 25 years ago when I attended, briefly, library school um, back in Boston. <laughs> um, then there's renting or licensing. Well, you pay, pay for it every year or you lose access. It really has you over a barrel. There's external control of the formatting. You say that's a blessing. Sometimes it's a curse. Usually it's both. Um, the external control over presentation and organization. This was one of the key things that I thought we as librarians were trained to do. Uh, but basically, it's really outsourcing it. And things might be preserved. There are sort of these guarantees of somebody else will have it. But what, what about the, uh, uh, the aspects? Um, I've been thinking about exactly what happens when we build up these organizations that we license from, whether they're for-profit or non-profit. These integrated services usually are bundled at, with the content themselves. So the services comes with the content. If the services were unbundled, so you could have the content, and you could go and uh, put different services, or there could be competing services, actually, I'd be really happy with this. But usually, it comes bundled, um, so that there's only one organization or company that you can go to. And bundling, say, with, the, with uh, journals, becomes common. So they really, again, sort of the turn of the screw that most of you have probably had to deal with uh, when contracts have hit your tables. And then there's these price increases. It's not really a liquid market. It's not really like you can go and say, well, this bunch of medicine journals are better than this, you know, or, or equal or whatever. Um, so this licensing tends towards monopoly. I would suggest that basically we are building monopolies when we engage in these, uh, building these licensed organizations. And I'll put some of our friends on here. Lexis, Nessus, and Leslaw, OCLC, Elsevier, JSTOR, I know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go hard here, but I think it's important to, to notice what happens as this goes through. There's Hathi Trust, and I, again, we don't quite know what DPLA uh, is going to be, but the idea of um, the, having these centralized uh, resources that we license, um, we end up with few publishers, few services, and one view. When we rent, um, I suggest that we're going to be reducing our li many of our library services, the things that we went to library school to learn, are really going to be replaced by being basically customer service departments for other people's services. This isn't good enough. We are the big libraries of the richest country in the world. We can do better uh, than this. 
Is there another way? I would say yes, and the technology has come around a corner that allows us to think quite differently. And that, I think, is, is a great advantage. What do we want? It, what I'd suggest is we want many of many things. We want no central points of control. We want many publishers, many booksellers, many libraries, many authors that get paid, and everyone can be a reader, not just the people that have sort of crafted themselves within a, a license restriction on our campuses. But anyone can be a reader. How do we get there? I suggest uh, we can get there, and we are getting there. But we have to work together, and again, our wallets will really decide our future. Let's buy the e-books that we can outright. What does it mean to buy things? It means the same thing as it always has. If you have 100 copies, only 100 people can be reading at any one time. But you own it. You have it forever. So it's, we, we pay for it. We own it. And publishers, some publishers, not the core publishers, but fringe publishers, are selling us e-books. And it's working. We can digitize our older books into an e-book format and lend them. This is working out very well. So we've digitized a couple hundred thousand current modern books. And of those, we make everything available to the blind and dyslexic uh, and have for a couple years. Um, but we take basically the 20th century and we've been lending it one person at a time. We've been using the same uh, technologies that the publishers use to protect their in-print works to protect these basically out of print works. So it's one person at a time. Um, and we distribute using open platforms like web browsers as opposed to going for bundled devices um, such as uh, Kindles. So we really tend towards uh, open platform de delivery. Those are the ingredients. So how, how is it going? Um, it's going fairly well. The technology for going and serving ebooks is about as complicated as serving your library catalog. Um, uh, sorry, the typo. Uh, serving is now as difficult as running a library catalog. Li books aren't that big. They're just not that big in terms of what digital. Uh, and if you're maintaining a catalog, you might as well maintain the actual collection itself. So how are we doing this? Well, we got good at digitizing books, thanks to you guys, thanks to Sloan Foundation, thanks to the Microsoft Co Corporation, um, and we've gotten it down to 10 cents a page. We're digitizing in 27 locations in six countries. We're digitizing over 1,000 uh, books a day, um, and it's going all, all along very smoothly and very well. Um, so this whole flow in terms of how to do this, and this includes all of the uh, optical character recognition, going and putting it into about 15 different formats, storing it on two continents, all of that stuff. About 10 cents a page or $30 a book. So it's about $30 a book is what it costs to digitize a book at the level of quality that you can see, which we're, we're pretty, pretty proud of. So where are we? Well, if it's a 10 million book library that we're trying to build, um, I, I'm using rougher numbers than, than your 27%, but about 20% tw about is out of copyright, uh, about 2 million. 7 million, say, in, in copyright, but out of print, and 1 million in print. We think that the public domain should be free, really honest to God, free. None of this, uh, oh, it's free, but Google says we can't do anything with it, free. None of that. Free, free. It's just open. <laughs> you can download all of it um, and go nuts. Uh, and we're now at 2 million uh, books that have been posted on the Internet Archive. So I'd say in many ways, check, we're doing pretty well on that front. So over this period of time of eight years, we, we in the open world, I think, have gotten a large part of the way there. We're a bunch of the way through the out of print, but still have uh, quite a bit to go. And we're starting to buy books from publishers um, on our terms, old style, buying them. Um, and uh, at least fringe publishers are going for it, if not the core, yet. What do you do with it? Um, l lending. What we're finding is lending is a good model. It doesn't cause people to rancor. It doesn't cause people to have endless uh, negotiations with lawyers. It's kind of what we have always done. We bought things, we lent it out. Um, and it, there's no lawsuits, maybe one will pop up tomorrow. But so we've been doing it now for about um, two years. Led with, uh, there are now um, about 1,000 libraries that have contributed 
in copyright books to be digitized and offered under their name, a thousand, in, from six countries. Um, and there, um, people are borrowing them all over the place in an in-library lending program as well as public libraries. So you have to be either inside a library or, or on campus uh, or not. Um, signing up because uh, we got uh, money from the stimulus program to digitize 100,000 books. So that all of that is available to anybody that wants to sign up uh, for free. I'm just going to flip through sort of how it, how it works. These are the 1,000 libraries, I guess, in eight countries. Um, if you're in one of the Boston public libraries, uh, if you go to the open library site, uh, you can see that you can um, get this particular book. Say I want to borrow it. Um, this is a, a new book. You look too young to be a mom. Say, okay, I want to borrow that. Oh, I'm sorry. This book said, oops, it's been checked out. Somebody else has it, so you can't have it. And since we only own one physical copy, we're only lending out one copy of this book at a particular time. Um, this is uh, another book that we we bought as digital uh, from this particular publisher. You can download the PDF and be able to see it in Adobe Digital Editions. And people are all over the world and doing it now. Um, it says you can loan expires in every after two weeks, it sort of automatically goes away unless you return it explicitly. Um, a Mayflower Ancestors book that's uh, being borrowed from the Boston Public Library, and it says that it's from the Boston Public Library. You say you want to read it in a browser, thanks to the public, uh, Boston Public Library from 1946. Um, and now you're, you're reading in a browser on things like iPads or iPhones or whatever it is you, you want to be reading on. So the idea of this lending program for dealing with the out of print is going along very well. Um, and it hasn't run into some of the other problems that others have, or at least not yet. Knock on wood. Um, so who has joined? We're now over a thousand libraries. University of Toronto, Alberta, Florida are all in. We have now all the public libraries in Kansas, California, and North Carolina, um, and, and turning those on over time, um, and Colorado Public Library Consortium and a bunch of other libraries around the world. Um, working on dis distributed discovery, by uh, offering all of the MARC records to be integrated in with other people's catalogs if they want to, or they can um, use a, an API service to be able to get uh, to them. How to join? Basically, you have to contribute a book. You have to open up all your public domain books, IP, IP, address, uh, IP addresses that define who it is you are, and a contact person, and it's free. So I want to say that th there's a possibility here of digitizing and lending books and buy and lend ebooks. That this is a way that's working. Um, it doesn't have any centralized points of control. I think we can make this go. It's not that expensive. Um, we're in process to try to get to the 10 million book library. Again, we're sort of at kind of two, two and a half million um, now. We still have a ways to go. Um, the one thing that I would like to throw out there is let's do a million books and have all of the people that are contributing significant amount of money, say 20 of us get together, 25 of us get together and say let's do the next million books. Then I, I would suggest that we digitize those and put that million books back into your physical collections. You'd have a few of these and you're, you're restricted by copyright to what it is you can do. Right? We're all law-abiding citizens here. Um, but exactly figuring out what we can do or not do, we can certainly give it to our blind and dyslexic. And there's starting to be uh, more and more uh, aspects of what we can do. Owning and serving a copy of this whole library costs $30,000 in hardware and declining fast. So what of our libraries would really not want to own a copy of the 10 million books? But then look at the people that you're looking to work with and are they going to give them to you? Um, and I would suggest that there is a, a role for us to have in our collections for a computer scientist, for a social scientist, for linguistics, for doing all sorts of interesting things that wouldn't be necessarily put up on an internet archive, a Hathi trust. Do it yourselves. These are the great libraries of the world. The corner we've turned is that the equipment is just not that expensive, that the capability of making searchable, browsable, downloadable, readable, can be legal within lending constraints um, and uh, appreciated. So this is just a, a way of, of saying there's an alternative. Uh, it's being built by a large number of others. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org. Thank you.